We think about what made a difference in our lives and hope that we can convey that through the effort of the foundation into the lives of patients that connect with us that we can then support. Who is Eric Ankerrood? Why would someone want to start a nonprofit organization to help the congenital heart defect community? What services does Heartfelt Dreams Foundation provide? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. And we're so happy you're here with us today. I am a heart mom to Alexander, who was born with a complex congenital heart defect in 1994. I'm also mom to Joey, who was born heart healthy in 1991. Alexander inspired me to become an advocate for the CHD community. Very excited about today's show to feature a special guest. Today's show is entitled Meeting Eric Ankerud of the Heartfelt Dreams Foundation. Eric's wife, Lori, was born in 1958 with Tetralogy of Fallot. Lori was known as a blue baby, and she had a ventricular septal defect or hole in her heart. She had a Blalock-Tosic shunt at the age of two. At three, her ventricular septal defect was closed and her pulmonary artery was repaired, which allowed her to have more normal blood flow to the lungs. While Lori's early childhood was fraught with heart procedures and doctor's visits, it was also filled with the love of family and opportunities for her artistic abilities to blossom. Lori and Eric married in 1985. They have two adult children. Although Lori has needed follow-up care, including major heart reconstructive surgery, she has led a great quality of life. She and her husband felt inspired to start a nonprofit organization to help others in the CHD community. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Eric. Thank you very much, Anna. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm certainly happy to tell you a little bit more about Lori and our Heartfelt Dreams Foundation. Well, I'm excited to hear more because your wife was one of the pioneers. Yes, she was. She was certainly born at a time where the open heart surgery to address congenital heart defects was not very well understood. It was just evolving. And in addition to that, the heart lung machine was just starting to come around. So prior to her birth, it was very difficult for cardiologists and these cardiovascular surgeons to address this complex heart condition. She happened to be born in the right place at the right time and was taken to Buffalo Children's Hospital in Buffalo, New York, where there happened to be two of the pioneering cardiologists in the country who understood her tetralogy of flow condition and decided that it was time to try out this relatively new open heart surgical procedure. Well, it's amazing to me how your wife has probably paved the path for people like my son to survive. Well, we certainly are, are hoping that, and, and we've learned through the years about the condition, and I have certainly learned a lot in the past several years as doctors became more knowledgeable of this condition. And certainly in my wife's case, growing up in that era, the cardiology community was starting to better understand how to care for these infants and these children. And as you mentioned, Lori went through a lot of heart procedures as a youngster into her early teen years, but now has thrived. And so we're hoping that her condition and her life experience can be an inspiration for others dealing with this lifelong heart condition. Oh, I'm sure it will be. When did you find out about Lori's heart condition? Did you grow up with her throughout your childhood and know about her heart condition? Well, actually, I did not. I actually grew up in a family where both my mother and father were working in the medical field, not as physicians, but had some background in that area. And Lori and I met in a rather interesting way in that I was in law school. I was playing competitive ice hockey growing up in Western New York. And I was playing in an ice hockey game when a common friend of ours, husband and wife, uh, the husband was on the hockey team and the wife was sitting in the stands, an errant puck went over the glass in the hockey arena and struck his wife. Well, it happened that Lori was sitting right next to her. And as I and other players went over to see how she was doing, that's when I first saw Lori. And that's how we ended up meeting in a little hamburger joint after one of the games. And I was just (laughs) smitten and infatuated. That is probably one of the most unusual ways I've heard of somebody meeting their spouse. (laughs) 
Well, I hope that the wife was okay. She was okay. She was not seriously hurt. And over the next couple of years, as Lori and I were dating, I started to learn about her heart condition and really just thought of it as another medical condition. I really didn't think of it as being anything severe or as complex as it really was. And I think part of that was because at that time, Lori was feeling very well. Mm -hmm. And she was leading a normal life. She was not growing up a child that was physically active in physical education in school, but rather she turned her attention to, I think, a natural born skill that she has, and that is with art. Mm -hmm. And so she was drawing and she was painting and I actually don't have that skill. And so as we met, I was really somewhat taken by that ability to do a painting without following numbers on the, <laughs> on <laughs> on the board canvas. that she was painting. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. I totally understand. I am not artistic in that way either. So it sounds to me like when you met her, there was no real concern about her heart defect. And even when you first got married, you thought that you would have a normal life with her. Well, we certainly did. And as we think back, based upon what we've learned in more recent years, I think there was a real lack of knowledge and understanding of the complexity of these congenital heart defects and mm -hmm. the fact that these patients would need care. And one of the things we also learned, as sad as it is in some ways, is that many of the infants born in that time with a congenital heart defect did not live into later childhood. And so Lori was really one of those patients that not a lot of doctors knew what to do with her. And we found that as we married and went to see physicians and, and went to see cardiologists more often than not. Lori was very frustrated because the cardiologist didn't really know what to say to her or what to do with her. And yet we didn't know that that was the norm in those days. And so I understood what was going on, but hadn't yet appreciated the needs that would come later in life. I'm curious, did Lori's doctors tell her or her parents that she was fixed? Well, they did. And Lori's mother was certainly a marvelous person in that day to get her from a rural community where Lori grew up into the city where she could be treated. And so Lori knew what condition she had, and I understood it and I accepted it. I think that the issue was that as she left the care of Children's Hospital in Buffalo, the pioneering physicians actually moved on and they were starting to build practices in other parts of the country. And so her specialized care went away. Sure. We she didn't were now, have the same continuity of care anymore. That's correct. And because she was feeling well, it really wasn't a grave concern of ours. It right. was more, let's find a cardiologist and let's go in once a year for the visit and see if they have anything to say. And, and she was getting into that routine, but there was really no information coming from that. And so we were kind of oblivious to her condition and what it might mean as she aged. Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna.
Eric, in segment one, we learned a little bit about you and Lori, but in this segment, I want us to talk about the nonprofit organization that the two of you created, Heartfelt Dreams Foundation. Can you tell me why the two of you started this organization? Well, Anna, this was a a very interesting journey for us. Lori is my hero. She has proceeded through our married life with fear of her heart condition. And as we learned, Lori was not getting the proper care that we felt she needed for her condition until we were introduced to a cardiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Richard Liebertson. Dr. Liebertson was a world leader in the care of congenital heart defect patients and was very familiar with tetralogy of fallot, the condition that Lori was born with. And that was about almost 20 years ago now that we were introduced to Dr. Liebertson. And that was really the first time in our married life that Lori was being cared for by somebody who knew what needed to be done for her condition. And Dr. Liebertson and I would have conversations as I was working professionally in the medical technology field, innovating medical devices, and some of which were in cardiology. And so we had nice conversations, at which point he came to me and pulled a medical textbook off his shelf, blew the dust off of it, and pointed to a case in that textbook and indicated that that was Lori's case. Oh my goodness. So that we, is we were so very cool. intrigued. Did she even know that she was a case study in one of the journals? She did not. And oh, this wow. was this was about her infancy and childhood and some of the pioneering cardiologists who had cared for her. And so at that point, I was starting to recognize that Lori was a special person, certainly in my life. And so as we fast forward to our Heartfelt Dreams Foundation, I mentioned the care that she was being given at Mass General Hospital because of the fact that Dr. Liebertson told us that at some point, Lori would have to have major heart reconstructive surgery to address the hole in the heart that she was born with. And it was a matter of time. Would medical technology advance such that the surgical procedure would be less risky versus her age. And so we knew there was a race, but we didn't know when the question would be called. And a few years ago, Dr. Liebertson announced his retirement, which caused us some anxiety. However, he handpicked his successor, a cardiologist, Dr. Doreen Defaria. And Dr. Defaria, after a couple of years with her, came to us one day and sat us down and told us that it was time. Uh, Lori needed to have major heart reconstructive surgery, and they were basically going to rebuild her heart. And it was a time in our life where our children had gotten out of college and were into their careers. I was in a place in my profession where I was working with a medical technology incubator as we were innovating novel medical products. And I decided that it was a point uh, that I would transition out and go into full-time consulting because this surgery that Lori was facing was so significant. Mm-hmm. And so as we updated our wills and sat in the waiting room for her to go into this procedure, we had been told that there were only three or four surgeons in the country that were capable of doing this operation. And it happened that one of them was at Mass General. So we were feeling pretty confident. I must say I was nervous, but Lori was just ready for it. Yeah. She wanted to have it done and and wanted to get through it. And after a nine hour plus surgical procedure mm-hmm. where they basically made five major repairs to her heart, wow, she came out and she went through six months of cardiac rehabilitation and is doing just fine. But what was interesting is that as she says, when they perform this kind of surgery, she has to go through a lot of preoperative visits and the doctors are looking for things. And of course they find things. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and so in the uh, subsequent years to her major heart reconstructive surgery, she had two other surgeries unrelated to her heart condition. Mm. The last one was a, a knee operation, mm. which was about uh, two and a half years ago. And just prior to her going into the operating room, I was sitting with her and an anesthesiologist came in, was speaking to us and her primarily for about 20 minutes, just remarking about her heart condition and just amazed that she was still around. And I was looking at the clock thinking, isn't there a surgeon waiting for her (laughs) as she's talking with us? And he ended up walking right up to me as I was sitting next to Lori, looked directly in my eyes and told me that I should write a book about her experience. And I thought, well, I can't write a book 
that quickly. But as I was sitting in the waiting room, came up with the idea, as Lori and I had been thinking since her heart reconstructive surgery, what could we do to help others? And that was really our objective in life now was to help others. And we had a number of ideas and we're trying to think through what we felt most passionate about. And it was after that surgery that we came home and said, we feel really passionate about congenital heart defect patients and trying to help them go through the experience that we had endured uh, without the complications. Mm -hmm. And so we, we sat around in December of 2018, um, thinking about Heartfelt Dreams Foundation and in about a month established the foundation in early 2019, rolled out the foundation and while driving in the car, heard about a little boy, an infant of a young family that had been born with a congenital heart defect. And that Within two weeks after we founded Heartfelt Dreams Foundation was the first patient and family that we assisted. And the family was really troubled by the fact that they couldn't find a doctor to address their infant boy's condition. And they were bouncing between a couple of hospitals and we communicated with the family and we provided them with some financial support through the foundation to travel to the specialty hospital that could care for their infant son. And that really motivated us to keep going with the foundation and move forward. And we've been doing that ever since. So it sounds like the very first case that your organization helped was a family of a little boy. What are the objectives of your organization? When we started Heartfelt Dreams Foundation, Lori and I were very much committed to helping patients and their families. And we recognized the grave need for patients to be able to get to a specialty heart center, regardless of where they live. But we also thought about the fact that there seemed to be a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge. And from my professional experience in training doctors on new and novel medical technology, we decided to add a second prong to the mission of our Heartfelt Dreams Foundation, and that relates to expanding medical education. And so our focus with the foundation is to help the patients and families, along with the medical professionals, doctors and nurses who care for these patients. I love that. It's a very unusual mission. I haven't ever seen another organization out there that has this specific mission. Well, we were very interested as we started Heartfelt Dreams Foundation to find out other nonprofits and other charitable organizations that are in this same space. And obviously there are some, and we are very much supportive of those missions that those charities have. But we felt that this was a niche that was needed to be filled. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that there was a space for heartfelt dreams to not duplicate what others might be doing, uh, but rather focus in a special way to address the mission that we had created. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. I have a feeling now that people are learning what your mission is and how you're helping families and helping the professionals who work with our children with congenital heart defects, they're going to want to know more about your organization. So can you tell everybody how they can find you? And friends, don't worry if you're doing your exercises or driving your car, the link will be in the show notes, but I just want to give Eric a chance to say it out loud as well. Well, Anna, thanks so much. And 
The best way to reach Heartfelt Dreams Foundation is through our website, www.heartfeltdreamsfoundation.org. If you're Google searching Heartfelt Dreams, you'll find us. But we're also on Facebook and on Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel as well. There are also telephone numbers available on our website to contact us by phone and a contact form that makes it easy for both patients as well as volunteers and doctors to contact us. I was really impressed when you started sharing how your organization came to be, how you provided that special service for that little boy. So first of all, I want to know, have you kept in touch with the family and how is the little boy doing? We have kept in touch with the family and the little boy is a fighter. In addition to having a congenital heart defect, he had other comorbidities that are causing him issues, but he is a fighter and he is continuing to grow. And so we are happy that we are able to stay in touch with the family. That's great. So tell me more specifically some of the services that your organization provides. Well, as we had done with this family, we provide travel expenses and hotel accommodations for the patient and their family to obtain the specialty medical care that they need at the hospital closest to them. But some of these patients have to travel a great distance. And so we hope that our travel and hotel accommodations can support them. And that travel accommodation is through ground transportation or through the air. We also provide emotional support and education through our live webinars. Our most recent webinar webinar was on COVID-19 and the congenital heart disease patient. We offer a academic nursing scholarship every year, encouraging nurses around the country who have an interest in cardiac care to apply through a competitive process. Our board of directors selects a recipient each year. We've been pleased to be able to provide that kind of support to the nursing community. We also have a quilt to care program. Lori is a, an artist and a quilter, and we provide quilts to the patients that we support, in addition to other types of support that we're working to build going forward. Wow, that's a wide variety of services. Well, we've decided that the congenital heart defect patient is a special patient, and we think about what made a difference in our lives and hope that we can convey that through the effort of the foundation into the lives of patients that connect with us that we can then support. I love that. Well, you said that you help provide hotel and travel accommodations. Is that only for people in the continental United States? Well, actually it is not. And part of that is due to the fact that the specialty heart centers oftentimes have international programs. And so if a patient is coming to us from outside the United States, we are able to collaborate with the specialty heart center in making arrangements for that patient to get here, stay here, receive the care and treatment that they need, and then go back home. Wow. So have you dealt with some international patients? Uh, we have had one or two international patients. Uh, by far, more of our patients are from the U.S., but we've been pleased that our reach has gone beyond the shores of the U.S. at this point. That's wonderful. Because some of my podcasts have been dealing with people from all around the world, specifically from India and talking about helping people in Africa, I'm curious what what countries the people were from that you helped with your foundation? We have had patients from Africa and Germany contact us. We are also addressing an issue that is domestic as well as outside of the U.S., where patients are nervous about contacting a charitable organization. And so we're addressing that issue by expanding the understanding of Heartfelt Dreams Foundation's mission. That's great. One of the things that we need to make sure we do correctly then is I have a resource guide on my website, which is congenitalheartdefects.com. And my webmaster is amazing. She has put together a huge spreadsheet of different organizations all around the world that provide different kinds of services. So we will make sure that when we list your organization, we attribute the correct services to it. And that will help people who find their way to my website to know how they can reach out to you. That would be wonderful and very much appreciated. Now, I know that 2020 was a horrible year for nonprofit organizations as far as having any kind of events or fundraising opportunities. So I see a lot of us are now moving forward in 2021, and we feel like we can finally start living again and start doing our events. Do you have anything special planned for 2021? Oh, well, we do. And, and we're trying to pick up on what we weren't able to do in 2020 with the pandemic. We had scheduled a congenital heart 
Disease Symposium in conjunction with the American College of Cardiology and the annual meeting to be held in Chicago in March of 2020. That was canceled. We also had a dinner event planned to celebrate the pioneering cardiologists around the globe, and we were expecting 100 to 150 doctors to attend. That was canceled. Oh, no. So we, we are also in the mode of going virtual and enjoyed oh. having a virtual 5K event in 2020 that the participation in that event went beyond our expectations. We had participants from Maine to California, from Texas to Alaska. And so we're planning to repeat our virtual 5K in the summer of this year. We have live webinars that are being scheduled every other month during the course of 2021. We have an academic nursing scholarship that we will be awarding in the September-October timeframe of this year. And we are now planning that dinner event for 2021 to go virtual if necessary. And so we think we have an exciting slate of events planned for the year, and we add to them as the year goes on. Oh my goodness, that just sounds amazing. And there's, again, such a variety to the different events that you have scheduled. Well, you we certainly try to do that. And we may even throw in there a, a charity auction of sports memorabilia. And so that might be a fun event that we do sometime during the year. Will there be a hockey puck up for grabs? <laughs> I, I think there will be a hockey puck up for grabs. <laughs> I have a lot of Canadian friends that will probably be interested in that. We'll have to make sure we let them know. Well, this has been so much fun. I'm going to let you say once again what your website is so people can hear it and get ready to go check it out. Our website address is www.heartfeltdreams.org. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for coming on the program today and for sharing your wife's story and how the two of you came to create this amazing foundation. Well, thank you very much, Anna. There is a great need for helping congenital heart disease patients, both young and old, find that specialty medical care that is needed for their lifelong condition. And we're so pleased and proud to be supporting the efforts that you have led. And we hope that our Heartfelt Dreams Foundation continue that effort along the way. That's wonderful. Well, that's all for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna and you're interested in starting your own podcast, why don't you check out Buzzsprout? I have been using Buzzsprout for years and I love their newsletter. They have a podcast for podcasters that I absolutely love and I listen to religiously. And our customer service is top notch. I honestly feel that my affiliation with them has improved the quality of my podcast. If you use the link in my show notes, we both get a bonus. It's a win-win situation. And that's all for this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.